Hi, welcome to one of the greatest San Francisco 49ers to ever don that iconic gold helmet. Jesse Sapolo, four time Super Bowl winner and one of the has been chosen as one of the greatest 49ers to ever play. Jesse, it is awesome to have you on the show. Thanks for having me on, folks. Uh, you know, we go back a long ways and uh, always appreciate you having me on. Well, it's always fun to talk football with you because I get a really unique perspective. And today we, we really want to spend a lot of time kind of deconstructing the 49ers as you see them. I know you have been, uh, you know, stayed on the West Coast in California, and but you've been very active in the alumni chapter, very active with the team. You know the organization extremely well, so I thought it would be great. We have a ton of San Francisco 49er fans, and I thought it would be great to get your insights and your view on this team because this is a team that when we came away from that near miss in the Super Bowl against Kansas City a couple years ago, I think there was a belief that for the 49ers, it was all right out in front of them. All they had to do was get to next year, and it was going to be their season. And then it, they, get, they ran into the injury bug, and it just chewed them to pieces. How tough was that for you to watch, Jesse, knowing how hard it is to get to a Super Bowl? Well, I, I knew after that close miss in the Super Bowl that uh, the mentality is to, you know, you got to start over. It's a new year. Uh, and that's coming from me that that actually went through that process of not only defending the Super Bowl, but defending it, winning it twice in a row. And uh, I knew you had to uh, remove yourself from what happened to you before and come in with the mentality that you're starting from the ground up, even if you know that you have the talent uh, to go back to the Super Bowl. Uh, it, it was really tough um, now because everybody has a been on social media and, and all the 49er fans were saying this is a revenge tour. <laughs> you know? I, I knew in my heart, there ain't no such thing as a revenge tour. You better focus on what's going on now. And I knew it was going to be tough, but I've never, Jeff, uh, in all the years that I've played, we've had some injuries. You know, there, on a bad year, we would have three to four key guys uh, at our mainstays on, 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 on the field that would be lost for me. I've never seen uh, anything like what the 49ers went through last year. Everybody has injuries and nobody's going to be sorry for it. But I've never seen anything quite like it. And, uh, and of course, when, when uh, your quarterback is one of those injuries, uh, it doesn't help your situation. Well, before before we go on, I, and see, here we go. Now, now, I just, I'm, now I'm talking ball with my buddy, right? How was Bill Walsh able to refocus you I mean, because at that time, in, in those days, it was you and Dallas, right? And there were some other teams, but it was really you and Dallas. And you you won it, and then that process of putting that behind you, how, how, do, how was he be able to do that so masterfully? Because so few teams do what you did, go back to back. Well, it was actually even before Dallas. You know, Dallas was great in the 70s. It was the Dallas was probably the second best team to the Steelers. And then in the 80s, it was the 49ers, uh, the Joe Gibbs Redskins when they had the Hogs, uh, the Lawrence Taylor, uh, New York nice. Giants, you know, with ourselves and Belichick. Um, those were the teams that kind of challenged us. But because we won four Super Bowls in the, in the 80s, we were the team of the decade. In those four Super Bowls, we made the playoffs nine out of ten years in that decade. And then we continued that on when Bill uh, left uh, after the 89 season. And uh, we went with George Seaver. And then Dallas drafted uh, Troy Aikman, uh, Michael Irvin, and, and, of course, Emmett Smith. They came back and challenged us. And th 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 those were the, the, the teams that that we played against uh, in the early 90s. And uh, they went and won back to back. And the only reason they didn't win three in a row is because we were in the way. But uh, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a mindset that's ingrained in you because you believe that's the culture you live in. And uh, it's not an easy thing to do. You know, when you come home and everybody's lifting you up, uh, you know, uh, congratulating you, 
inviting you to the barbecues, you know, it, it, it's almost like you don't have enough days in office to, to please everybody because, you know, especially if you go back to back, yeah. And the year we went back to back, the second of those Super Bowls was a 55 to 10 a drudging of the Denver Broncos and John Elway, one of the best quarterbacks who ever played the game. And, and then we, you know, we played the next year, we went all the way, you know, we were a fumble away from, from going for a TV. But in those years, it was really tough because every year we, we won the Super Bowl, we had five preseason games. If you remember correctly, they used to send us overseas yep. to go to the league called NFL Europe. So, you know, the, the NFL wasn't going to send teams that were not known. They were going to send the teams that were in the playoffs, the teams that won the Super Bowl. And it was tough. It was tough for me physically. You know, honestly, to be honest with you, by the time we played the Giants in that third straight NFC Championship game, I was almost running on fumes, you know. Yeah, I mean, you know, that's a lot of games in three years, and uh, but again, you know, no excuses because the mindset was that's where we're supposed to be, and we're there to make history. Uh, unfortunately, we, we fell a little short of winning three in a row, but uh, that's the mindset. So when when we went to the Super Bowl, <laughs> you know, all this noise going on, saying you know it's a revenge tour, we should have beat Kansas City, no. That that year is gone. You better concentrate on what's going on now, and 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 re reprogram your mind that it's it's starting from the ground up. Okay, so now let's go to now. Let's go to the 49ers today. When you look at this roster, and you see that Jimmy G, the first the first thing we got to talk about because it's the first thing everybody's going to talk about is have they put themselves on the path for a quarterback controversy in San Francisco by taking that kid, by moving up to take that young quarterback? I don't think so. I, I, I just think that we're looking at the future, you know? And every time you look at the future, especially at that position, people will turn it around and say it's a controversy. Well, you know, I mean, we got Steve Young sitting on the bench for four years. You know, if, if that happened today at the age of social media coach, <laughs> you know, if, if you think this is bad, you know, we had a Hall of Famer sit on the bench for over three years. I mean, think about that. We had okay, a see, Hall of Famer sitting on the bench for almost four seasons. Well, and your, because we didn't have social media, we, we, didn't, we, didn't, we, we dealt with it, but it was manageable. But, but you know what? It wouldn't happen today. You're right. You're exactly right. There's no way that would happen today because the, the agents wouldn't let it happen. The pressure from the media would be too intense. Social media, like you say. But Trey Lance, when you, when you, see, when you see the guy, Jess, here's a guy that's played 17 college football games. 17 college football games. And this is not to be – I'm not knocking North Dakota State. But that's not USC. That's not Notre Dame. That's not Florida. That's not that's North Dakota State. Oh, obviously, extremely talented kid. But how rough is it going to be for a guy from that background with that little football play to step into an NFL huddle and all of a sudden, oh my God, that's George Kittle and oh shit, Alex Max snapping me. That's Mike McGlinchey. He played at North. Do you know what I'm saying? How hard is that going to be for that young kid? Well, I, I like again. You know, it's all in his mindset. You know, I walked in. I walked in that lot. I was at Barrington High School <laughs> when I first uh, saw how good Joe Montana was going to be. Then the next thing you know, you know, I'm about five yards away from his lot. And then the next thing you know, it's a kid from Cali that's snapping to arguably at that. You know, the best quarterback to ever play the game. It's all on how you can put it in the right perspective. Um, I, I uh, you know, Trey is going to have to uh, know that George Kittle has a stand, uh, starting point. And his starting point was fifth round, right? Yeah. So here he is, the third pick of the draft. Uh, you go in there. Uh, you know, you, like you mentioned, USC, right? Uh, how many quarterbacks from USC have worked out in the game? You know, that has come. I mean, we're talking about perspective yep. and yep. the things that people will throw at this kid. Uh, but then he can look at uh, Carson Wentz, even though right now uh, his momentum is going, you know, 
the arrow is going down a little bit, but there was he won the MVP at one one year. So where is he from? <laughs> so it all depends on how you look at it. And I think it's important that you build your mind a certain way. Uh, because there's a lot in my 15 years, coach, there's a lot of linemen that try to come and take my job. Guys that were six four, six five from big schools, you know. If I would have looked at myself and said, well, you know, I'm, I played at Hawaii, I'm not supposed to be here. Then maybe my career would have taken that, that path. That's but a, that's, that's it's, a great it's, point. It's all up to how Trey, you know, perceives the situation. If, and don't be afraid to ride the pine for a year. I mean, the best young quarterback in, probably in history is a kid from Kansas City. Did he, did he sit on a bench? Yes, he did. The guy that they think is the most gift, uh, you know, physically gifted quarterback is the guy from Green Bay. Did he sit on a bench behind Brett Farm? He did for a couple of seasons. So you can't be afraid and get into, well, this guy came straight and started in league. Because if you look at guys that started their first year, there's not a lot of guys out there that won Super Bowls. You know? That's you really know, true. Because it's, if you're throwing them in the, in the Lions den, you're hoping that it works out. And sometimes... They get beat up in that process and never come back. So uh, we have faith in Kyle and how he's going to play this thing out. But it's it's a lot on how uh, Trey can walk in there and say, hey, I'm here because I'm the future of this team. I belong here and I'm going to do everything in my power to get it done. OK, so now this is this is fascinating stuff to me because that was Steve Young when Joe Montana was the quarterback because they, they went out and spent that money to get Steve Young because they knew that was the secession plan. How did those two guys deal with that between themselves? Because obviously Joe was the guy. He was, the, I mean, he was the guy and Steve wanted to be the guy. That's a, that's a dicey, dicey, dicey proposition. How did Bill handle it with you guys, and how did you handle it internally in the locker room? I, I think it was more dicey from the outside looking in than it was for us that were in it. Uh, we knew the guy that we knew the guy that gave our organization, you know, multiple Super Bowls at the time before Joe won his third and fourth. The organization he was already with us. Uh, you know, but at that time, we knew Steve had potential, but we didn't know he was going to turn out the way he did. Uh, you know, you know what potential means. It means yeah. he doesn't have absolutely nothing. It means so, coaches get fired. That's what it means. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So, you know, it, the, the, the thing that you got to give Steve credit for is that he wasn't content on just sitting on the vine and, 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 and riding the bench. Steve wanted to play. And that made it seem like uh, a, a controversy. But in our minds, Joe was the guy. But we knew we had a, a, a real, real good quarterback that can come in just in case something happened to Joe. But if you look at how things turned out, I felt like we, we kind of let Joe go a little early, you know, maybe a year or two early. Because if he didn't have that concussion in Buffalo when he was with the Kansas City team, Kansas yeah. City would have been in the Super Bowl. Yeah, that's exactly and if you right. remember how the people talk about John Elway, uh, he's Mr. Comeback, uh, Captain Comeback. Uh, Joe Montana, at his age, took Kansas City to Denver on a Monday night. Elway scored with a minute and five seconds left. And Joe brought back Kansas City and beat him with a touchdown pass in the corner of the end zone. Uh, what does that tell me? That tells me that we would have done fine if Joe was still with with the 49ers, the talent that we had around him. But we were ready to move on. If, if you remember my last Super Bowl, our fifth Super Bowl in 94, we only lost two games. And one was the second game, it guess where, in Kansas City. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Versus, versus Joe Montana. And then and then we hit our stride and went on to win, uh, to dominate the Chargers in the Super Bowl. But, but that, that was a good problem for us to have. Now, now, was it was it comfortable? No. But as you know, Coach, nothing you accomplish is ever comfortable. <laughs> that's that's to, really to get to where you want. You know, everybody wants, can be a nice, happy locker room, be super nice to each other. 
or you might not win anything. Yeah. So, and that's the atmosphere that kind of Bill Walsh kind of built. You know, I remember uh, my, my draft class, <laughs> it was a third, fourth preseason game. And Bill brought all of us up to his, to his office. And he looked at every single one of us and said, I need more from you guys, you know? And then after the fourth preseason game, you know, I was the 11th round draft choice. They cut our third round draft choice from UCLA, a guy named Blanchard Montgomery. And right away, I realized what he meant. But I need more. <laughs> but that's, that's what Bill was all about. Tell me now, you know, again, one of the things that I think gets lost in all that history right because you had so many hall of famers and so many great players on both sides of the football but one of the things that the def- and, and and i think you guys got mislabeled jesse i really do i think you got you got labeled a finesse team but you were a physical foot you could run the football and your offensive line was extremely well coached and extremely tough and extremely good fundamentally. I, I I don't even want to know how many hours you guys spent on the Crowther sled, but I know it had to be, you know, more than anybody should. But when you look at this 49er team, when this offensive line is healthy, I think they have maybe as good a line as there is. Everybody talks about Indianapolis, but I really, really think the 49ers offensive line is outstanding. I think we have a, a, a real good offensive line. I think we have talent. There's no question about that. You know, Williams out there now with Matt coming in. Uh, uh, we have our, our uh, left guard. Uh, that's been the mainstay there. But there there's two, two positions uh, that, you know, we, 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 we have to wait and see how, how they step up. But so, but, you know, coach, obviously, uh, you can be talented as individuals. The best lines are the guys who play together. Uh, but I think that the jury's still out on McClinchy. You know, we'll talk about him. Um, you know, he 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 needs to step up. We, where he was drafted is where people's expectations. Right. Uh, why the people's expectations are so high that they think he he can play a little bit better. And and uh, and. Uh, but that's life in the. I think we have a good yes. uh, but I think the guy that um, that's there now uh, now we had some injuries. We had some injuries in camp. You know, we lost two scores in camp. You know, this year. And that's why uh, Kyle canceled the rest of mini camp. So um, I don't know. I don't know. I don't believe the field of practice if it's been blessed. I don't know. It is crazy because it's like uncanny how many injuries that they've had up there. And, you know, uh, when, when you compare the two teams, the team that you played on and, the, and this team, uh, both of them were kind of – I see some similarities. You, you want balance in the offense. Now, you were known as the West Coast passing team and all that stuff, but you guys really were a balanced offense, right? You could attack outside. You could attack with the tight end. You could run the football. You, you know, you could do all those things. When this team's healthy, I think this team has the potential to be a, that kind of offense because you've got a showpiece tight end. You've got Ayuk and that speed outside. You've got a stable of good backs, I think. Again, I just really think if they can stay healthy, that offensively they've got a chance to be real, real good. Defensively, how are they going to deal with the loss of Robert Sala, who was so big a part of that defense, Jesse? Well, we're going to have to deal with it. Um, I, I think our new coordinator has been there for years and and, and has been working with, with uh, Robert Sala. But, you know, it just goes to show you, uh, two years before we went to the Super Bowl, or maybe a year and a half before we went to the Super Bowl, fans were asking for Coach Salah's head <laughs> to get fired. But it just shows you how things can turn around uh, uh, quickly. And I think Coach Salah did a nice job motivating those guys. It helped that we had five first-round draft choices up front. You know, and, and of course, we lost one of the, the – we, we lost the leadership 
of uh, Wine Eye product, DeForest Buckner. Exactly. He went on to have a great year with his Colts. You know, it's, it's just tough that, you know, uh, you can't keep everybody. Uh, but how the, how the NFL is built right now is you got to make sure you develop these guys quickly in their first contract, the first four years, and see if you can win the Super Bowl in those, in those years because there's no guarantees if one of those guys within that four years become a star that other teams won't offer more money that has more room under the cap. So, you know, um, I think, you know, like you said, IU had a great year last year. Debo Samuels, who had a great year when we went to the Super Bowl. If he doesn't have a nagging injury, he's one of the strongest. Kind of reminds me of John Taylor. Maybe not quite as fast, but how he can run over DBs for receivers. So we definitely have talent. I think the beauty of this offense, too, is, is Kyle Shanahan. A lot of people went away from the fullback. But Kyle Shanahan, you know, brought the fullback back to, to our offense and very innovative going. Yeah, and because I that's a guy, use check to me, is now you can call him a throwback or you, you know, I know you, you don't see that position very much anymore, but man, oh man, can does he add a dimension to that offense? Because he's he's a threat to catch the football, he's a devastating blocker, and he and he's you know, he, he if you hand it to him, he's gonna make some plays with it. I, I just really think he might be as big a key to that offense almost as Kittle is because there's so much flexibility, so many cute things that they do with their blocking schemes because of Kyle Juszczyk's ability. Oh, absolutely. And, and uh, he's Mr. Do Everything, you know, and, and he came from an Ivy League school, but he had ability that Kyle saw, and now he's a purple as, as a fullback. But you're absolutely right. Kind of reminds me, we had a guy named Tom Rapp yep. uh, that, that came from Nebraska, that was, you know, sweep the floor, wash the windows, you know, whatever we needed to get done. Uh, second year of our back to back Super Bowls, Rathman had over 100 catches. And think about that. Uh, but I think the similarities is, is there. Um, this offensive line, if they can hit their stride, uh, will be a, a, a big help. Uh, Jimmy staying healthy is a big help. Um, you know, anything that Trey Lance uh, can show in camp would be a bonus if Jimmy stays healthy. You know, uh, but I think we have the potential to um, be a great offense, similar to what we did, uh, you know, the year before. Now, if you remember our running in the playoffs, we had running backs by committee, you yep. know, and we just pounded, you know, we pounded Minnesota. We threw them all like nine times, you know, and uh, – over 250 yards, and, uh, and that's winning any game. Yeah, that's a, that'll make your defense better too, because your defense will be standing on the sideline. They play great they defense when you're on the sideline. Yep. They get, they get they get three cups of water on the bench on the defensive side instead of one. If you if you go over three the ball, uh, and and the offensive line gets better, pass protection becomes better when you run the ball. Better. Like any human, getting is like we're gonna we're gonna destroy these guys. They can't stop us. We can do whatever we want to do. And usually that happens. If I know we were the West Coast uh, the creators of the West Coast, but how we get off on our run after the catch, guys, we had uh, we weren't that good. The guy named Jeremy Rice and John Taylor, so. Uh, once, once we run, we hit an awesome. awesome. Jesse, when you look at these, and I, and I think it's really Jimmy because we haven't seen enough of Trey Lance yet, but when you look at him, what does he need to do in your mind to take that next step as a quarterback, to be that guy that can not just get you to the Super Bowl, but he can make that throw that he didn't make late in the game to Emmanuel Sanders to win the thing. Cause I'm betting if that was Joe Montana throwing that ball, we'd have another, another, another uh, trophy in that trophy case in San Francisco. Yeah. I, I, I think we have to be um, realistic 
Uh, the fact is, I think Jimmy's good enough to take us to the Super Bowl. Right now. Uh, you know, he missed that pass against uh, against uh, with Sanders uh, being open late in the game. Um, but the protection wasn't quite the best in that game. So things lead lead up to what was going on. Jimmy was getting hit, you know, and and when 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 that happens and you're trying to to, to throw the ball long, which now you got to hold the protection for a little longer, and he have been hit all game. And those things can happen. Um, now, is, is Jimmy uh, Aaron Rodgers? Or, I, I think his calmness and the kind of person that he is, he has the potential to win us a Super Bowl in, in his own way. But you look at, we lost, uh, one of the other two Super Bowls we lost in the history of the 49ers was to Joe Flacco. You know, and, and if you look at the two quarterbacks at Baltimore, um, won the Super Bowl with is Trent Dilfer and Joe Flacco. Now uh, those guys better than Jimmy, I don't think so. Uh, so it, it's 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 a it's a matter of uh, you can't look at it as you know Joe Montana's loaded with weapons and that offense is unstoppable. We have a good offense, you know, we have the potential to put yards up like we did back in the in the eighties and nineties. But it might be a little bit different in how you distribute what the expectations are. Uh, you know, can Jimmy win us a game? Yeah, he, he went to New Orleans and went, you know, blow for blow with uh, with Drew Brees and won that game late for us. Uh, does he need to be more consistent? I think that's where the expectation is uh, uh, is, is up higher, where we hope we can be a little bit more consistent. And uh, but I, there's no doubt in my mind. I think. It's just, all right. I, I appreciate so much, Jesse, you're taking the time. I, I, we got some, Michael, can you come out or if, if you got your camera on? Hey, uh, camera's not working, but the questions are in the chat. Jeff, I'm sorry. Okay. All right. Can Jesse, you got some questions from, from our viewers. If you would be patient enough oh. to t take a couple, fire them at me, Michael, what do you got? Okay. So the first question, uh, Jesse is from Fred Flunk in Dublin and it uh, sort of resonates in regards to COVID today. Uh, the news. Um, do you think it's going to be a, an issue, Jesse? You know, obviously, the NFL has come out with rules today saying you know pretty much you know players need to get vaccinated. Do you think the majority of players will, will get vaccinated? I think the majority of the players will get vaccinated. Uh, now, I, I don't agree with the fact that they have to be vaccinated to play the game. You know because. You look at these young men, a lot of them don't have children yet, you know? Can you guarantee me that uh, this vaccine won't affect their ability to have a family where their kids might have issues? You know, I, I think I would rather uh, give them the choice that they're, they're young with their immune system, if, if, if that's their argument. Uh, but I think uh, for, the, for the team, Fans to be able to come to the stadium, I think everybody should, should try and get vaccinated. But but if you have concerns for a young player uh, that wants to raise a future family, then I think we've got to think about this. That's a good point. Michael, got another one? Yes, sir. Uh, obviously, Jesse, you were a one career man. That is very rare nowadays in numerous different sports. And I think that's something to be. Uh, upheld and it's fantastic Ed, that's a question from Barry in Edinburgh did you ever consider leaving San Fran at any point in your career or did you sort of know from the get-go that, that you were always or you always wanted to be there well there was, <laughs> there was you know when I when I was my, the majority of my career we could have become legal free agents and that's why we fought so hard because the way the NFL used to be folks can can tell you this uh, I can play three years of my contract and play it out. But for me to actually move to another team, the 49ers have to be compensated. You know, even though I played the full three years of my contract, played it out. So it wasn't, it was never a true free agency. Now, towards the end of my career, like my last, you know, four or five years, we won the right uh, to have free agency, uh, but we gave up the cap. Uh, 
So it was tempting when I, 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 I re-upped with the 49ers. I extended my contract with the 49ers. And then my agent called me the next week and Arizona didn't know I re-upped with the 49ers, you know, because there was no social media. You know, the, the 49ers kept it secret until it was time for them to make it an announcement. And I saw the kind of money that the Arizona Cardinals were. <laughs> <laughs> now, you know, I felt like jumping up and throwing my couch in a swimming pool. Anyway, uh, it, 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 it was good to, to know that you were wanted. But uh, uh, the fact that I look back on it now that I finished with one team for that long, I think it's something special. Absolutely, something special. Your your career was something special, and and really, I, I I just it's amazing when you hit me with that again, and I yeah I don't because I can't even visualize the draft with that many rounds. First of all, but eleventh round draft pick, and you have four Super Bowl rings. You voted one of the greatest players to ever play for the San Francisco 49ers. I mean, when you were coming out of Hawaii as an 11th round pick, did you have any inkling that it was going to turn out to be what it, what it turned out to be? Uh, to be honest, I came, I came, I came to camp pissed. <laughs> because you were 11th round to, pick? Yeah, I came to camp a little disrespected, but you know, being a Polynesian, you kept it all in. Uh, you don't, you don't come in the locker room and start showing an attitude those bets you don't. Well, or give you a hard time. So I did everything uh, respectfully, uh, but on the field, they knew right off the bat that they got something wrong. They knew right off the bat because, and I knew this because <clears throat> uh, the line that the 49ers had at the time was the line that just won a Super Bowl in 81, you know, 82, they were good. Uh, <clears throat> and then 83, I came in and, and that line was under the impression that they were going to be together seven, eight, nine years and nobody was going to be there, you know. So they, when they probably saw they drafted uh, an offensive lineman from Hawaii in the 11th round, I don't think any of them lost any sleep <laughs> out of the draft. But, uh, but right off the bat, uh, and, it was, and it was so funny, uh, uh, Jeff, because, you know, I'm an 11th round draft choice. My signing bonus wasn't that big. And I, you know, I'm from Hawaii. And when it got down to the third preseason game, and I, I had some positive media write-ups that I I, I I heard about. And, but you know, being an 11th round draft choice, you, you don't know. You have no idea. The coaches don't tell you how you're doing. So I was walking into the locker room after one of the, the practices of two days with Bob McKittrick, who was my old line coach. And I just wanted to have an idea where I stood because at least I can go find an apartment. You know, if you're if you're eleventh round draft choice, you better find the cheapest apartment. There. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how I approached him with it. Uh, this was before uh, the third preseason game, and I said, "Coach, you know, um, how how am I doing? You know, is there a chance that I could make the team? Because you know, I'm just kind of looking at." some cheap apartments uh, uh, to rent if I make the team. And he says, I'm thinking of the two veterans that, that are backups and see who's going to not make the team because you're going to make the team. Wow. And I was I was totally numb walking in the locker room. I felt like jumping up and down. But, you know, uh, the, the, you know how we grew up in, in, in Hawaii and Samoa. We, we, we try not to show the excitement. And, and I, I couldn't believe what I heard. You know, but I didn't tell him. I didn't tell I was him gonna. I, I was gonna ask you. Did you call home that night and say, "No, I, I'm no, gonna... I didn't call home." And and you know what's funny? Uh, uh, is I was still I was still tense going into the last cut. I was still tense. I you know you don't. We stayed at a hotel. We stayed at a hotel and and. Uh, after the last piece of the game. So my cousins came, there's a lot of people in the house. Let's, let's go for a drive in the city, maybe a tour of the city. So if you get cut, at least you, you got the tour you of the city. You got to see San Francisco. <laughs> so, so they picked me up, we went out, and we didn't get back to three in the morning, right? So I came back to the room and I slept. 
And then I woke up to some noise early in the morning of guys pulling their suitcases into the parking lot. You remember the head coach for Pittsburgh? He was our ninth round pick, a guy named Mike Malarkey. Yeah. He was a he was he was a ninth round pick my year. He was a two picks before me. And I saw him pulling his suitcase uh, to the car. And I'm I'm in the balcony and I looked over and I said, Mike, where are you going? He says, Oh, they, they called me yesterday at you know eight at night to say that, you know, in the morning in my playbook, I got released. I'm like, wow, I wasn't even around to answer the phone. <laughs> So I'm, I'm, st I'm still having nerves. I, I, I go to the locker room. I slowly walked in there and I took a peek and my stuff was still there. My, my uniform was still there. And that's how you know? Well, I, I, I don't assume anything, you know. So all of a sudden, uh, this uh, equipment manager we got that used to be with the Chargers that knew the local boys that played for the Chargers. So he tries to speak English, uh, pitching to me. And he says, you made the team, bro. <laughs> <laughs> and and, uh, and even at that, it wasn't until my old line coach came downstairs and congratulated me uh, that I got on the pay phone. I got on the pay phone, coach. No way. Was in there. <laughs> it was in there to call my parents to, to let them know I made the team. Wow. How awesome was that moment? <laughs> it was good. It was now, good. I, did it, did that, did that, uncertainty ever wear off that that was there a point that you knew you were going to be there oh was it yeah there was a stretch of about and it was a nice thing there was a stretch of about six seven years that i knew i made the team uh, and that's why i held up <laughs> <laughs> well how about at the end when it when you knew you only had a few more to play how to, mm -hmm. how, how what was that like when you when you're sitting um, there you know, I, I uh, what happened is, you know, we, we lost a, a playoff game in mid May. It was after my my 14th year, you know, and, and I knew I was going to go in for Hartford, you know, to uh, correct the, uh, air, the, the, the leaky aorta valve that I played with all those years that we kept a secret within the doctors and organization. And according to the doctors, that if once they operated on my heart was straight down to normal size, and they performed a certain procedure that we didn't have to use an artificial valve, which would allow me to come back and play. So I was excited about that. What I didn't take into account is that what was the 49ers thinking? You know, they have a hard time taking a chance out of a guy that comes off a of torn ACL. You know, I, I didn't take into account that the 49ers be willing to take a chance with a guy that had a torn aortic valve and had open heart surgery. You know, so after my 14th year, the 49ers released me. <laughs> after my surgery. And, you know, uh, my wife is still angry about that. <laughs> I told him, hey, man, I'm back at work with the 49ers. You know, you know like, we still get checks from them now, so what are you mad about? <laughs> so... So uh, they released, you know, because they cut my chest open and and, uh, and repaired my heart. Uh, but the doctor said the heart shrunk down to normal size for the first time in years. And I thought I was done, you know. But the kid that took my place, uh, he, he kind of fractured his neck a little bit. And, and so, you know, when you, when you, when you uh, crack your chest bone open, it's a little bit of a different injury than if you're rehabbing an ankle, you know, uh, so I thought I was done. I was out there playing golf. You know, it, was, it healed enough to where I could swing the club. And at least I could, you know, I'm in the middle of a golf round and he said, what are you doing? <laughs> playing golf? <laughs> Sometimes 36 holes a day just to get the fact <laughs> that I'm, you know, I'm not in camp, you know? And and he says, a 49ers call is gone for his neck. Uh, what kind of shit? I said, well, honestly, uh, delay negotiations. Negotiate with them for about seven days. Let me go to the YMCA. So I went to the YMCA, which is not crowded. I put a towel over my chest, and I could feel the wires that they used to hold my... I could... 
get out of here. I was, I was trying to bench, you know. And within that week, I went up to about 275. I was able to do it, you know. It was healed. It's just the fact that I haven't been exercising on it, you know. And and and, and there's wires that hold, hold my chest together. Because when I had my surgery, Coach, it took six hours. The surgery was scheduled for three and a half hours. And, my, and uh, Lisa was worried about it. But they said they never, they said it, it took us over two hours to close him up. Because we usually have surgery on 75 year olds, you know, that when they we cut their chest open, it just kind of falls into place. But I said, but your husband is in the peak of his, you know, of his, uh, you know, he's still in his 30s. He's been lifting weights on his, you know, most of his life. It was thick trying to get in there. Uh, so it took us a while to, to close them. So, uh, so I, you know, uh, I worked out. I told Lee, I'm in pretty good shape running wise. You know, I ran a little bit. I said, so I reported into the 49ers on a Wednesday and I started in Denver the last preseason <laughs> on a Saturday. So, no way. Uh, yeah, so you John Madden comes down on the field. I'm, I'm warming up on the corner. He walks up and he says, how are you doing? I said, I'm doing good. He says, how long have you been practicing? I said, two days. <laughs> he said, have you been hit on your chest yet? I said, no, but I'll find out soon, you know. And he just shook his head. But but here's the thing. Yeah. What I do now, I look at it now, it's crazy. But at the time, mentality of how we build ourselves at the time. I had a mentality of a warrior. I can survive anything out there, you know. Now, there is just no way I would attempt that stuff. Well, I've been removed from the game. Yeah. But, you know, back then, it was, it, was, it was a challenge for me. I needed to do it because a lot of kids in Samoa had rheumatic fever that caused that defect in my heart that uh, I wanted them to know that they can have the surgery. And and uh, and play in the NFL if they decide, which is really a big big message because we've been to Samoa together, and you know as well as I do that you don't go to the hospital in Samoa to do anything but die. Am I right or wrong? That was the problem, you know, because when I got the rheumatic fever in Samoa, the symptoms what was uh, your joints swell up, right? And uh, my mom and dad took me on the bus to a masseuse, <laughs> not, not, knowing, not knowing that my heart that was, was infected. It wasn't until I came to Hawaii that the symptoms came back that they, they found what was wrong. That's amazing. Amazing story by an amazing guy and really one of, one of the best people I know in football. And, and I am very, very proud to call him my Good Uso, brother. my brother. And, I, and uh, uh, you know, I always appreciate how you uh, inspire in the islands every time we go. And, and that's a special thing. Uh, uh, you know, I, the only way I can motivate you is to be in the You know, uh, just to see you get their attention and, and how they feel inspired to come back the next day and practice hard. It's a special gift, and I always appreciate that about you folks. Well, I appreciate that, Jesse, you saying that. By the way, uh, I got a message from the Big Island that they would like to have a, a Polynesian Bowl combine, Polynesian All-Star Game combine on the Big Island. And I've got some contacts that for you that uh, I think we can pull it off. So I, I would love to be a part of that can, with we, you. We can talk about that as, as we go because that's, that's another exciting uh, thing that we'll do. All right, my man. So Jesse, uh, Fafakai Lava and... Telly Lava, actually. Thank you very so, so very much. Thank you, Coach.